Um, so we're going to have some fun. So my talk is engineering creativity. And you know, I threw the word engineer in here because we're at Georgia Tech. So I thought you know, you'd pay attention more. So it's good. But I have a book coming out that I've been working on for three years all about how anyone can have moments of creative genius. For the book, I interviewed about 25 living creative geniuses and tons of academics who study creativity. And the thing I found is when you actually look at creativity, we think of it as something very different than it actually is. So let me tell you what I mean. Now, creativity for many of us is one of those things that you know it when you see it. It's, you know, you look at that painting, you're like, oh, that's creative. Versus when you look at one of my paintings, you go, hmm, not so much. But there's some people who are just so good at this. There's some people, the creative geniuses we think of, Pablo Picasso, uh, Mozart, Beyonce, that are really, really good at this. You know, we think about over here, we have Oprah, Elon Musk, uh, you know, Steve Jobs. They're able to create product after product, book after book, song after song that is incredibly successful, right? They are the true creative geniuses of our world. Of course, you also have to remember Taylor Swift. <laughs> so what's interesting about creativity is that it's very intertwined with creative genius. It's hard to talk about creativity without talking about the people who actually execute on it. One of the most famous creative geniuses is Paul McCartney. He has the number one, most number one singles of any songwriter ever, more than John Lennon. And he wrote the song Yesterday. Yesterday is the most recorded song in history. But what's interesting about the song Yesterday is how he came up with the idea. See, Paul McCartney one day just woke up with it. He literally talks about this in interviews. He says, I woke up one morning with a tune in my head and thought, hey, I don't know this tune, or do I? This creative genius literally woke up with the most recorded song in history. He was actually so worried about this that he had accidentally maybe plagiarized it that he went around for weeks and would actually hum it to people and say, hey, have you heard this before? He was like, I'm suspicious. <laughs> and um, this is also true. You can Google it. But he didn't have lyrics, so he used his placeholder lyrics. This is true. I'm going to sing it for you. Scrambled eggs. Oh, my baby, how I love your eggs. Da -da -da -da. I believe in scrambled eggs. The crowd goes wild. <laughs> this is true. So we have these stories of creative geniuses creating these amazing things, and it just seems so easy, right? They have these flashes, these moments that we, us normies, don't have. So... This is what I call in the book the inspiration theory of creativity. And it's the main way that in Western culture we think of creativity. There's four main elements. The first is that it's individual-centric, right? It's Steve Jobs. It's Elon Musk. It's Beyonce. Second, it's easy, right? Paul McCartney literally wakes up with this. He's not struggling, right? We all know the story about J.K. Rowling was on a train, and she had the idea for Harry Potter, and she like, wrote it on a napkin. Third is it's overwhelming, Right? It literally kind of ripples through them. Inspiration is like this sort of physical force. And fourth and finally, they're kind of weird. They're a little bit manic. They're maybe a little neurotic. They're maybe a little bit odd. And what's interesting about this is that it's also unattainable. Right? This notion of creativity means if we weren't born with it, if we weren't born with the ability to just wake up with songs, then how are we going to actually learn to be more creative? A study done by Adobe found that only 25% of us think that we're living up to our creative potential. It's pretty depressing. I know, he's really cute. <laughs> so the question I had, and one of the questions I tackle in the book is, is this actually true? Do you actually have to be born with this sort of amazing mystical genius to actually be creative? <gasps> so what if this wasn't true? There's a lot of studies that dig into this. And what's amazing, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this, is the research shows this is actually wildly different than the truth. The truth is actually that creativity is a skill. It's a muscle. It's something you can get better at. Let me show you one of the studies. So for this study, we're going to go to Austria. And in Austria, there were some researchers at a university. And they had a pretty basic question. Do you have to be an IQ genius to be a creative genius? And so how they did this was they took a bunch of students, 
and they had them do an IQ test. Then they also had them do what's called a divergent thinking test. It's one of the academically valid ways to measure creative potential. And the whole idea was, okay, you have to be a genius to be creative, there'd be a correlation. The higher the IQ, the more creative you would be. But here's what they found. There was a correlation, but only up until a point. See, IQ is on a standard bell curve. If you have an IQ of 100, half the world is smarter than you, half the world is less smart. What they found is that there was a correlation, but it stopped at an IQ of 104. If you have an IQ of 104 or higher, you have the same creative potential as everybody else. An IQ of 104, it's everybody in this room, right? There's well over 40% of the world. This is billions and billions of people with the same creative potential. It's not just a handful of creative geniuses that we can all name and think of. So this is called the threshold theory. It's the idea that above a certain relatively average IQ, we all have the same creative potential. Yes, all of us. So if we all have this potential, well, then the obvious question is, how do we unlock it? How do we actually get this potential to the surface? And so to tell you this story, I'm going to go to lovely Phoenix, Arizona, the Phoenix suburbs, actually. You might retire there one day. And I'm going to tell you about a little video rental store. Now, if you're like me, you probably don't remember video rental stores, like a hazy memory. But here's what they look like. And uh, those are VHS tapes. Um, they sell raisinettes. You might be familiar with those. I know. This is like Netflix, but like in a store. And at this video rental store in the suburbs of Phoenix was an 18-year-old community college student named Ted. He was the clerk. And this is not Ted. Ted didn't have a beard. And um, you know, what was weird about this is that every day around 6 o'clock, something would happen. A line would form of people waiting to talk to this 18-year-old clerk. They would wrap around the comedy section, the horror section, all the way past the weird international films, all wanting to talk to Ted. Because for some reason, Ted had this amazing ability to tell you what movies you would like. If you said, I like Woody Allen, he said, how about Albert Brooks? If you like this action movie, how about that action movie? He was like a film sommelier. He knew all the different movies. And the reason why is kind of interesting. So Ted grew up in a sort of chaotic household. His parents had him when they were teenagers. He had four siblings. They were poor. And so to escape, he would go over to his grandmother's house. And this is what you get when you buy stock photos for a grandmother's living room. <laughs> this looks kind of 1960s, but it was the 1980s, so play along. And his grandmother loved entertainment. She loved Hollywood. She would constantly be playing TV. She had all the Hollywood gossip magazines strewn across the living room. She would talk about the actors and actresses with their first names, as if they were former lovers and friends. And Ted found that this was an escape. This was somewhere where he could get away. He could really be safe. And so one day, when this physical Netflix opened down the street, he walked in and he started looking and playing, you know, moving around the movies. And the owner was like, wow, this kid's really into this. Why don't you work here? And he was like, yeah, that'd be great. But here's the thing. Video rental stores, I know I have to explain this. I'll be slow. They're empty during the day. Because people are at work. They don't really rent movies, right? You're not watching Netflix at work, okay? And so Ted was like, well, I could do my homework. Or I could watch every single video in the store. And I'm not being hyperbolic. You know, it was the 1980s. There wasn't as many videos. But he literally watched every single video in the store. And what happened was that Ted had consumed a huge amount of content. He understood what movies were out there, what people, people have seen, what was similar, what was different. And from this, he developed taste. This taste went on to serve him incredibly well. He's now the chief content officer of Netflix, which this year is producing 700 He's of original programming. Over the last 18 years, has completely upended Hollywood since he started. He's in charge of all content licensing, content acquisition, all of this. And he describes that time at that video rental store as a film school and MBA all wrapped up into one. It gave him the underlying ingredients for his creativity. But why? This is actually a pattern that you see over and over again when you look at the stories of creative genius. They constantly are consuming. J.K. Rowling was asked in an interview, how do you become a great writer? And what she said, that the most important thing 
is to read as much as you can like I did. It will give you an understanding of what makes good writing and it will enlarge your vocabulary. So why does this work? When I interviewed these creative geniuses for my book, over and over again, they told me they had some period of intense consumption. You know, if they were maybe a novelist, they went to the library and read lots and lots of books. If they were a musician, they would sit in their room just listen to all these songs. But why was this tied to creativity? And so to talk about this, we're going to fast forward to me in 20 years. I aged really well. <laughs> and for some reason, I'm reading a paper newspaper. It's weird. It's nostalgic. And um, I'm paging through this oddly paper newspaper, and I come across a crossword puzzle. And what's interesting about crossword puzzles for the science of creativity is how we solve them. See, there's two different ways you can solve a crossword puzzle. The first is what we call logical processing. This is when you're looking at the crossword puzzle, and you're like, OK, there's like an R here, an R there, maybe an E. Oh, it's green. I got it. I got it, right? That's a very slow, deliberate, conscious way to process. And this happens in the left hemisphere of our brain. See, it's very kind of cliche to talk about right hemisphere, left hemisphere, but it's actually really important to the science of how creativity works. See, in the left hemisphere of our brain, we store the dominant meanings of words. So, for example, if I said, mm, what is the color of the sky? You'd say blue or gray. And when you're solving a math problem, the left hemisphere of your brain is working through it and very consciously solving this step by step by step. It's a very aware process. Now, there's another way you can solve a crossword puzzle. You've all had this experience. Sometimes you're looking at it, and you're just looking, you're like, oh, it's green. You have sudden insight. And what's interesting about this for scientists who study creativity is that these types of sudden insights, these are the same things from a biological perspective as those flashes of genius. So they give us a way to actually study how our brain works when creativity is happening. And here's what we found. So these flashes of genius, one of the people who studies them a lot is this guy named Dr. Edward Bowden. He's a professor who works a lot with the Creative Brain Lab at Northwestern University. I interviewed him a lot for my book. And one of the things he said, that I think is a really good sort of punchline to this, is that aha moments are a normal cognitive process, but they have a surprising result. See, what happens is that our right brain is in charge of having more nuanced, more metaphorical associations. So, for example, if you're watching a stand-up comedian and assuming they're funny, they say a joke, your right brain instantly connects the pun. It gets why it's funny. It's not thinking through the joke very logically and trying to understand it. You know, another way you can think about this is think about a word like worm. If I said visualize a worm, you might visualize something like this without the weird face. But... Your right hemisphere would do something different. Your right hemisphere would be like, mm, what about gummy worms? Or those songs that you can't stop thinking about, you know, earworms. So our right hemisphere has this amazing ability to connect distant concepts. But the thing is, is that it's actually not special. It's simply subconscious. Our right hemisphere is doing this processing all the time, trying to connect new and different and disparate ideas, but it does this all below the level of consciousness and only comes out and says, hey, when he actually has the idea. And it feels somewhat magical, but it's simply biology. And the thing is that you can actually learn how to make these happen. And the reason how you do this is it's all about consumption. So Dr. Edward Bowden told me this in our interview, and I put it in the book twice, the second time in bold. It was really obnoxious. Because I think it's really important, this quote. He said, you can't have insights about things you don't know anything about. Paul McCartney grew up in a household where his parents were musicians. He was listening to music throughout his entire childhood. He played in a cover band for years. So yeah, of course he dreams about music and you don't. J.K. Rowling also had a troubled childhood. She would lock herself in her bedroom and just read books to escape. So yeah, of course she dreams about characters and you don't. But that doesn't mean you can't. So for the book, I interviewed all these different creatives. It was ranging from you know, billionaires like David Rubenstein, YouTubers like Casey Neistat, uh, Nina Jacobson, who was the president of Walt Disney Motion Pictures. And over and over again, I found that they spent a huge amount of time not creating content, 
but consuming content. Because consuming content is what gives you the ingredients to actually connect and have the ideas to bring together. And one of the most interesting things was not just they had some period in their childhood where they spent all day locked up reading or watching or doing, but it actually continues to this day. So even people like Ted Sarandos, even though they're running you know, big organizations, even though they have all this success, Ted Sarandos told me that he still watches three to four hours of television every single day. Because consuming content is how you form creativity. And so I call this in the book, I call it the 20% principle. It's the idea that even to this day, these people, these people we aspire to be, they spend 20% of their waking hours simply consuming content in their niche to give them the raw materials to be creative. And so the thing I want to leave you with today is that consumption, the thing we may all feel a little bit guilty about, is actually what leads to being able to create. Thank you very much.